Friends, Calgarians, countrymen, countrywomen, lend me your ears. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Anush Newman, and I am the 2015 Global Fest Human Rights Forum Director. It is with great pleasure that we welcome you to our 2015 Human Rights Forum. This project was conceived by the Global Fest Calgary shortly after the City of Calgary signed on as a co-signatory for the Canadian Municipalities Against Racism and Discrimination Declaration. And since 2007, the Global Fest has been organizing these forums to promote civil liberty and equality, hopefully leading to less discriminatory practices. We take great pride in the fact that our forum is very unique and unmatched locally and nationally. We're the only city who has this. We believe that with these types of projects that we build liberal democratic society to protect the rights of all the members of the community. Although we live in a small corner of this nation, but we are greatly affected by global and national issues. Issues that might be considered too far and distant sometimes, however, they may have great implication on our lives. Today's format will be as our moderator will introduce our presenters, and our presenters will present their piece, their um, speech and their experience, and share with us their um, stories. And after that, we're going to have a half an hour session for, for you to have an opportunity to ask questions of our speakers and for them to answer you. And when that happens, please, please make sure that you have a clear and concise question when you're ready to ask it. So now please join me in welcoming Cheryl Popick, manager, Toronto Dominion Bank, and our main sponsor to continue our program today. Cheryl. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, perfect. I'm pleased to be here this afternoon for this annual tradition that we sponsor with Global Fest. This is TD's eighth year supporting Global Fest in their Human Rights Forum. At each year, this, and each year, pardon me, the speakers and topics bring together an even more dynamic group to share experiences, knowledge, and solutions to bring out change in creative, positive, and safe communities. At TD, we share that commitment to creating positive communities where diversity is embraced and celebrated. For us, diversity is about more than being competitive and relevant to the communities in which we serve. It's about building an organization where people like myself do not feel excluded in any way, regardless of their ethnicity, physical abilities, or disabilities, gender, and sexual orientation. We, we participate, excuse me, in many outreach efforts with the aim of recognizing, encouraging, and celebrating diversity and building long-term relations relationships with the diverse communities in which we serve. In Canada, we designate at least 15% of TD's giving to diversity-related organizations. So thank you, Global Fest, for giving us the opportunity to express and experience a bold and refreshing look at what it means to build inclusive communities. This afternoon, we're incredibly fortunate to have a distinct panel here to share their insights into the Canadian Indian Residential Schools Act and how 2015 has been a year of reconciliation. Leading this panel today is Dr. Jackie Ottman, Director of Indigenous Education, Associate Professor, Weckland School of Education of the University of Calgary. Dr. Jackie Ottman, Anishinaabe, Originally from Fishing Lake First Nation, is the daughter of Chief Allen and Marjorie Pakunchan, wife of Pat Ottman and mother of two young adults. Ottman is currently Associate Professor, Director of Indigenous Studies, Coordinator of the First Nations Métis and Inuit Education Program at the Workland School of Education, and Second Vice President of the Canadian Society for the Study of Indigenous Education. Jacqueline has been an active in research and publications that focus on successes of Indigenous education, supporting Indigenous students, Aboriginal language, and literacy. Indigenous leadership and governance, leadership development, organization cult organizational culture, change management, diversity, and intercultural leadership. She has been invited to present at conferences across Canada, the United States, New Zealand, and Australia. With those impressive accolades, please 
join me today in expressing our gratitude for having her be here, Dr. Jackie Ottman. Thank you for that introduction, and I'd like to welcome everybody to this particular forum. And first of all, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional territories, uh, the Treaty 7 territory and uh, the Blackfoot Confederacy, Confederacy historic uh, inhabitants of, of this particular land. And uh, I do appreciate uh, and value being um, invited to this particular forum. Um, so I'm just honored by, by everybody that is, that is here. And um, as was mentioned, 2015 is uh, a very important and commemorative year for uh, not only Indian, Indian residential school survivors, but, but indigenous peoples in Canada. Um, for, for many, many reasons. And uh, part of that is because, uh, because of the truth that has begun to emerge through the stories of Indian residential school survivors. And um, that policy, particular policy, um, is an example of, of uh, schooling gone wrong, actually policy gone wrong, and the detrimental impact that policy can have not only on the immediate society, but, but generations into the future. And in this case, seven generations of, of children and communities were impacted by one particular policy, uh, the mandatory and unilateral enforcement of, of, of residential schooling on communities, First Nation communities across Canada. And, also impacted Métis and Inuit communities. So the dialogue continues. And uh, as was mentioned, as a lot of you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission began in 2008, in June 2008. And, um, and it ended uh, with a series, well, actually 94 recommendations at the closing ceremony in Ottawa. And, um, and I was actually present for that particular ceremony, and it was it was very very profound uh, to be to be uh, to be in the presence of um, of the people there. Um, and before I introduce our our uh, guest speakers, um, um, just wanted to share some quotes. And um, Willie Ermine who is a scholar and a, an elder from Saskatchewan, says, Indigenous peoples, as Indigenous peoples, we have lost our most precious, human, precious of all human rights, the freedom to be ourselves. And uh, so, again, in terms of human rights, you know, that is an important question for us to, to, uh, to consider. And, um, and what does it mean to actually... Um, to lose our human rights and how does it affect our, our whole being, our identities. And um, another one of the quotes that uh, I heard actually um, at, the, uh, at the closing ceremonies was actually said by uh, former Governor General Mikhail John. And she said, in order to come together, we have to understand what's keeping us apart. If we don't recognize the wrongs of the past, the future will come upon us with, your re with revenge. And so now that the, truth, the truths have been shared, and um, now is, uh, the call for reconciliation has been, has been done, has been called. Um, and uh, so one of the questions on the Truth and Reconciliation web website is, what does reconciliation mean to you? And again, you know, we have to consider what the concept of reconciliation is before we, act, before we, we consider how, uh, what it means to us. And, um, and all of that requires reflection and dialogue. 
And so again, today we have an opportunity to continue on with that dialogue. Um, we do have one person who is missing, and that is uh, Chief uh, Vincent Diallo, old woman from Siksika Nation. And uh, so he sends his regrets. Um, and today we have, um, I, I practice this very, very quickly. You can hear me whispering in. Um, awakasina. And uh, it, uh, Elder and Dr. Reg Kroshu, Kroshu, sorry, from Pigani Nation. Dr. Reggie Kroshu, uh, and his name means Dear Chief, is a well known Pigani Blackfoot elder, spiritualist, ceremonialist, teacher, and former chief of the Pigani Nation. Dr. Kroshu has pioneered and initiated cross-cultural programs for many organizations and institu institutions across Western Canada, including as the executive director of the Old Man River Cultural Center in Alberta and director developer of the cultural interpretive program for the World Heritage Site, head smashed in Buffalo Jump Center. Dr. Kroshu earned an honorary doctorate in law from the University of Calgary and cur currently conducts cultural interpretive safety programs, workshops in traditional management systems, and models of ethical space in research and indigenous governance panels, and teaches First Nations perspectives on holistic science at the, at the Faculty of Indigenous Studies at, at the University of Calgary. Welcome, Dr. Kroshu. Next, we have Reverend Canon Travis Enright. The Reverend Canon Travis Enright is highly involved in both the uh, di di diocesan work. Dawson. Dawson? Dawson. Uh, okay, liaison work with the Aboriginal community of Edmonton and within the Ang Anglican Church of Canada. <laughs> Travis is a status Indian, a Cree man from James Smith Cree Nation. He helped to develop Standing Stones and is an eloquent and provocative voice advocating for reconciliation and a living faith. He also co-chaired the Regional Advisory Committee for the Alberta event of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission held in Edmonton, March 27th to 30th in 2014. So. Okay, so now um, we will have uh, each panelist um, introduce themselves, and they do they do have um, you know approximately twenty minutes to to share their stories, and um, as you know, also related to, uh, to the residential school experience and reconciliation. So um, we'll begin with, uh, with Dr. Reg Kroshu. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, when the Reverend was pulling the table over, I thought we were gonna arm rest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from uh, uh, the Pikani First Nation in Southern Alberta. And uh, um, I want to talk a bit about my um, um, uh, experiences at residential school, but I also want to talk a bit about some of the work that I've been involved with, uh, working with post-residential school. Uh, so when I was young on the, in our reserve, we had a big family, there was 11 of us. And my mother got sick and she got sent to Campbell Hospital. And in them years, they stayed at the hospital for about a year. So when she was taken to the hospital, we were all delivered to the uh, residential school. But um, prior to that, uh, while she was sick, I was raised with my uh, grandmother. And my grandmother 
always taught me who Creator was. Creator was Creator. She always taught me my language. And then we had our younger ways of learning. She made me join the uh, Little Birds, Sister Cheek Society. And then she made me join the Chickadee Society. So knowing the society and the, and the practices taught me how to solve my problems. If I had any challenges at all, my language, my uh, practices, the belief in Creator, I can solve my challenges, all in my language. So that's who I was before I went to residential school. I was Awakasin, dear chief. But then, one time I was in class, I was in the, the uh, Little Birds, and, and uh, the old lady that came in to teach us taught us about our numbers were bugs, plants, animals. Those were our numbers. Our formulas were um, in our language. How many? If you take and add and subtract, those are in our language. So you take animals, stars, and and, and, and plants along with your language, and you know what math is. You, you, can, you can solve a challenge that give, that's given to you in our language. When you pass a certain level of counting, at that point, they gave us a song. And that song was like a for counting song. So I still remember those songs. But every time you pass a level, I think in the, in the chickadees, it was one level, or two, or uh, little birds, it was one song. But in the chickadees, it was two songs. So it was like the different levels of counting and, 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 and challenging math. That was how we, I understood math. And I knew I passed those levels because I had the songs. The songs were like my report card. But I also had many other challenges that I, I, I uh, that the, the elders that came into TP taught me. And then one day, I was uh, uh, I found myself in the, on the other side of the school fence, and it was called the Saint Cyprian Residential School, and it was an Anglican residential school. That's why I was thinking we were going to arm wrestle. <laughs> I got some left in me. <laughs> so uh, I ended up in the residential school, and things changed at that time. I was in a classroom, and the classroom was square. It wasn't round anymore like the teepee we had. There was a bell, there was a blackboard, there was a teacher. And we sat in rows. So in my concept of learning and paying respect to learning was totally different. It was in a round concept. And we sat in a circle. And everybody knew where they sat. And they knew when to talk and when to respect the teacher. But you're sitting in a classroom. I was trying to grasp at the concept of what, where were we and what are... What are the rules, and who's helping us? So as we went on in class, they taught us math. They taught us the numbers, one, two, three, the symbols, the plus, the minus, the equals. They started teaching. So when they asked me uh, challenges, they would say, one plus one equals what? And those, I didn't really understand them because they weren't, I didn't learn them. I knew my language. 
So I could visualize the, the, uh, the ants and the, and, and the stars, and I can visualize who was left, and I know who, how many was left. So in our way, I knew what the answer is, but I couldn't explain in Western concepts and numbers uh, what the uh, formula was or the challenge was. So I'd give out the answer, but I couldn't, I couldn't uh, um, uh, talk about the formula. But also, that was a level that I already knew. I passed that level, and I had the song for that level. So first of all, if I spoke my language at the residential school, I was punished. There was no way. I can talk about the plants and animals and stars as numbers, but I knew them. I couldn't talk about formulas, how I understood formulas. And I couldn't talk about, uh, uh, oh, the other thing is, I couldn't sing the songs that showed in our culture that I passed those two, th first three levels of counting. So there's, if you sang the songs, then you'd be more in trouble. You get enough trouble language, but you sing a song or, or you mention creator, it, it, we were in trouble in, in the classroom. So my challenge at that young age was, here's an adult that was supposed to help me and protect me and teach me, all of a sudden is turning on me. Because I, I couldn't explain to her what, how I knew my numbers and how I knew my formulas. But yet I was at a level, higher level, than what she was talking to me. And I couldn't understand the symbols. So it was that cultural concept of oral culture and written culture that was clashing. And as a young person, I was caught in the middle of in the middle of two systems. And, and one system trumped the other system, so we had to follow that system. So those were the challenges I had at residential school. There was many challenges, all kinds of challenges we had at residential school. Um, after the residential schools closed, um, I was lucky that my grandmother was still alive, my parents were still alive, and my aunts and uncles. So I went home to my family, and, and they started speaking to me in, language, in our language. My father owned, or my grandfather owned what we call a thunder medicine pipe bundle. At one point, when we went to residential school, the Indian agent was collecting bundles. And bundles in our culture are symbols of governance, leadership, laws, and uh, conflict resolutions. Those were goals and objectives in an oral um, concept that we, we use bundles to settle conflicts and, and, and look at leadership. But the, but the Indian agent was collecting bundles from the reserve and he was selling them to the museum. So my grandfather hit that bundle. He didn't want to bring it out. Um, and also, when we were at residential school, the Indian agent would say, well, if you have a bundle, you can bring it to me and then you can go visit your children at residential school. Otherwise, you can't go visit. So that was, a, that was a concept there. But also, when I was at residential school, uh, when I was young, probably about eight, maybe nine years old, I ran away from residential school in the wintertime with my friends. And my auntie hid us in the attic. And I distinctly re remember the, the RCMP coming in, and I could hear them through the ceiling. They told my auntie, you better give those kids up because the, I st we tracked them here. 
They got to go back to residential school. We're going to give you one day, if you don't bring them back to residential school, the first one to go to jail is going to be my father. The next day we're not back. The next one to go to jail was my mother, then my brothers. So they were, I heard this, and at a young age, you don't know what to think. So when they left, she took us down from the attic and brought us back to residential school. But when they signed the papers in those government policies, if you don't take your children to residential school, you're going to go to jail. So the ultimate power on the reserve was held by maybe three or four people, the Indian agent, the Northwest Mounted Police, the uh, uh, principal at the residential school, and the nurse. Those were four people that had ultimate power that can do anything. So. I was brought to resident, back to residential school, and at grade eight, that was when residential school, you finish. So my father and my mother took my brother and I and my sister, and we went to the, uh, the Indian agent at the band office, and he was asking if we can go to grade nine, maybe go to the town, Pincher Creek or Fort McLeod, and go to grade nine. And the Indian agent had a big discussion, pulled out the papers. He said, well, in order for anybody to go past grade eight, you need to forfeit your treaty status. You need to become a Canadian. You can't be an Indian anymore. So we'll fill out these forms, and we'll send them to the Minister of Indian Affairs to sign them. And once they forfeit their uh, status, then you can go into the uh, grade nine. So we had a discussion at home, and my dad said, no, we're not going to give up your status. We're, you, you're just going to have to finish school now. You can't go any further. So those were challenges that I experienced when I went to residential school. Those were, were policies that uh, uh, Indian Affairs had. When, when the residential schools closed, um, before, before I went to residential school, I, uh, uh, we used to live on the east end of the reserve, and we were baptized uh, uh, Roman Catholic. And then we, the Indian agent brought us up to the town site, so we we're on the west side. So for me to go to residential school at the Anglican school, I had to be baptized again, Anglican. And when they shut the residential school, the Baha'is took on the contract for resident or for education, so I had to be baptized again. They only ran the education for one year, and then the Mormons moved in and collected the kids, <laughs> and I was baptized. <laughs> Yeah. So I was telling my wife, geez, if I had those opportunities to go to school like the young people today have, I would have four degrees instead of four, uh, four, four baptismal certificates. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the realities of the time when we look at government policy. How do we... Those were challenges that I, I experienced as we moved ahead. The toughest thing was the schoolyard. Mm. Our, even our own people in the schoolyard. As young boys, they, the older boys would use to take us and, and, and they would split us up and they would t teach us how to fight. And they would, they would challenge each other, that their fighter is better than the other fighter, and they'd put us in together to fight. You had to survive those fights, otherwise the boys, the older boys that are looking after you are going to beat you up. So it was those kind of survival in the schoolyard was important. If you spoke your language, somebody's going to report you, and you're going to end up getting punished or getting the strap at residential school. And in the school, yeah, there were so many rules. So 
Today, when I look at the community, today when I look at the community, we've taken that trauma and continued it on. Even though the school is ended, the Indian agents are gone, we have self-government, we have our own people, but the trauma of how we treat our, our uh, own people is still there. So when we look at, when we talked about truth and reconciliation, those are some of the truths. But reconciliation, I heard the elders said, we need cultural competency mm -hmm. before we can have cultural safety mm -hmm. to entertain that reconciliation, that forgiveness. So those are one of the biggest things that the, I hear the elders talk about. We need to work with our own people to develop that cultural safety so that we can entertain uh, reconciliation and forgiveness. As a Cree person, I'd like to acknowledge my being allowed in Blackfoot territory. I have a, uh, as a, a person, I have a, a great relationship with residential schools. Um, my mother is from James Smith in Saskatchewan, who went to Gordon Residential School, who, if you wanted to go in history and read about Gordon Indian Residential School, it is probably one of the ones that they identified as the most horrific. And my whole family have been a product of Gordon Indian Residential School. So my grandmother, my grandfather, my uncles, and my aunts all came out of that particular iteration of horror. Um, my father, who came over from Ireland, he left Cork as, a, as an Irishman. He came to uh, Canada as something else, he'd always say, because they changed his name. Uh, his mother died in childbirth when he was seven, um, and he went to uh, a Catholic orphanage, which is a residential school. Um, so both my parents grew up in a system of uh, um, Christian indoctrination and um, institutionalization, what it means to be institutionalized. And these concepts of, of that are not something, people say, oh, as, as an Anglican, you're all gonna go back to you know, Hogwarts, right? That's what they're thinking. They think there's a brawl, they're running around with you know, sticks and you know, having fun. You know, but that's not the system in which the private, the, the public school system in England was not the mechanism in which these residential schools were founded on. They were actually founded on debtors' prisons. That is what they were actually founded on. And how to, um, you'd have to always pay the way, um, your way, and there's a penitential component to that. So both my parents grew up out of that system. Um, I want to talk about my grandfather. Uh, so my grandfather, um, God love him, up to about five years up to his death, and he, he lived, what, 92 years old, believed in assimilation. He believed in it. He, he would not, he had 13 children. Uh, three of them died at different ages of, of child, of, 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 of different rearings. Um, but he had 10 children left. Seven of them were women, were women. Or women, and he would not allow any of those women to marry Cree men. He would not allow it. He would he would not allow it. Um, and he fundamentally believed in the Anglican way of 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 education, because he the story that he his justifying justifying story for this, and I love him to to I grew up with him. He grew he he taught me well. Um, he said that. Um, white people, no offense, I just, that was his word. White people are like these little rodents that you get into the, into the dirt, right? Once they're in your dirt, you can't get rid of them, right? So you, you, you can flush them out or whatever, but you have to learn to live with them, 
right? And, and he also believed that the Creator may have brought these white people here for a reason, not necessarily to, um, to do that. So we have um, uh, a saying in our family. This is like, it's, it's a stubborn saying, you can't tell a Heinz pickle anything. That's what we say. If you're being stubborn, if you say, oh, you can't tell a Heinz pickle nothing. And the story of that is when my grandfather went to Indian residential school, um, there was a table, right? And in the center of the table were a jar of Heinz pickles, right? And only the people in the front, you know, and he'd give people gifts, right? Um, so the, the, the headmaster would give gifts of Heinz pickles, right? And if you went there and you uh, were naughty, you would never get a Heinz pickle, right? So my grandfather, being my grandfather and a good man, and a good horse rider, um, took a li- the, the priest took a liking to him. And the priest couldn't ride a horse if his life depended on it, right? He was just a bad rider. So one day, um, my uh, uh, grandfather set the horse up, and it was beautiful, and he rode off. And then he, he took pride in that. He says, oh, I did that. And on the way back, the, the priest hit him right? Hit him hard. He says, don't ever assume that you're smarter than me, right? So the next day, uh, the, the priest saddled his own horse, right? He saddled it up, and there he went running off, and he went, tuk, 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 and thud, right? So he came back, and he beat him, and he, my grandfather had to spend a whole entire winter with the horse in the stable, right? Taking care of that horse, but even with that story, even he would say to them, I tried to tell that Heinz Pickle something, but he wouldn't listen to me. But he, that, that inbreeding, that, the, the, the pulling out of his identity and putting something inside of him was so strong that you couldn't even put it back. You couldn't, he, you know, up to he was five years, his whole family went to Indian residential school. Everybody. He was directly affected by the torture and the horror of what we did. And I say that we did because I've chosen to wear a little white thing around my neck, even though I come from that story. And I've sat with 33 people at different iterations of the common experience and what is the other thing called? Um, The reparation where you get money. We have to do a, uh, adjudication, different adjudications. And I've sat through th- all those stories and they ripped my heart out. And I had to sit there and I did it purposefully because I needed to know, let them know that the church was wrong. Right? The church was wrong in that. However, I've also listened to a nun who at the age of 22 years old went up to Fort Smith, and she was from Montreal. Her language was not the greatest of English either. She goes up to Fort Smith, and she has 40, I think I remember, I always say 40, but she was 42, 43 kids. And there's other kids, there's probably, the school had maybe, maybe 150, 200 kids in it. But she was responsible for 42 children. And we go think now, oh, that's not so bad. We have class sizes 42 children long now. But she is responsible at the age of 20 to look for 40 to 45 children for 24 hours. So they had to go up, when, and every child would have a, a nightmare or whatever. And the line that I always struck with, and I told it earlier to the lady who was interviewing me, said she was mother to 42 children. And I have to admit it, she says, I was a horrible mother. I was a horrible mother. Because at the end of the day, I had to develop a system in which violence was an important part of that. So not only did the system crush children, it also crushed young women who went up there to teach. In my mind, the whole system was corrupt. And I say that, I would say that with a room full of clergy, a room full of bishops, anybody. I would say that without um, um, afraid, being afraid. 
So when I decided to become a Christian, for me, it's not simply about do I believe in the church. I came, my grandfather gave me a faith, and my, all, all his kids came back as well. And he took them in, and he saved them, you know, from this horrific thing. And my grandfather and my uncles and my aunts all had very, had very massive drug and alcohol problems. Still to this day, we have drug and alcohol problems. But the thing that I want to say now is, I don't know how to put this gently, I believe in forgiveness. I honestly, I say the church, we have to be a church of forgiveness, not because it's wrong or right. It is because it should be in our DNA. It should be we as followers of Jesus Christ who say, and we did horrific things to people, have to go on our knees and repent for it and turn ourselves back, not just us uh, individually, but our whole institution. We have to change not just one little component part of it. We have to change the whole institution. And the way we change that is fully acknowledge and be ready to give the apology at a moment's notice. Any Aboriginal person who comes up to you as a clergy person and says, I demand to you to, to, uh, to, I want an apology from you instantaneously, without a thought. It should be part of our DNA, without any expectation of being forgiven. But I also say to the congregation, that says, we have to move also into seeing thanksgiving. We have to see that this man and his stories are thanksgivings. Not just thanksgivings for the Blackfoot or for the Cree, but for all of us. The stories that, are, that were part of this land for 10,000 years are the very stories that will shape us and make us who we really are. We're not from diverse places. We're not a country, a land without culture or without heritage or without history. We have 10,000 years of history built into the stories and the songs of the people who have been living and praying on this land for that time. For me, that is the church's end of being reconciling. We have to look at places and people not as commodities, which we used to do before, but places in which they can share their own thanksgivings with us and be part of a, a journey. When I co-chaired the, the, the TRC in Edmonton, um, the local event, some of the most important parts of that work was hearing elders speak at us in acknowledging the wisdom that they had more authority than we did and having the humility to put our degrees down, to put all our strength down, and like being one of the four powerful ultimate people, to say that there's power in a much more diverse, um, complex way. So the residential school system that um, started off as a corrupt system and is acknowledged to be a corrupt system has to be turned around and be made useful in a different way. We have to figure out ways in which we can no longer desire to arm wrestle, right? But to hold hands, not to shake them, but to hold hands so that we can somehow figure out ways we can walk together. One of the teachings that I, I've taken, and I've changed it into a bit of a Christian teaching for myself, is that um, when you go for a long run, and you're in a race, um, you have a choice. You either choose to be last with the, the weakest person in the race, or you can choose to run fast by yourself and be first by yourself. I think the church is in its state, has to learn to walk and be last with the weakest. And that's the, the art of the next the year of reconciliation for, for my church figuring out ways in which we can actually hear the story, hear the drumming, hear uh, the teachings, and not simply tell them what to do. Um, so that's all I pretty much have to say.
Thank you so much for that, um, Elder Kroshu and Reverend Enbright. Um, I think what I would like to, actually what we have now is an opportunity for question and answer. And um, I have some questions of my own that I'd like to begin with. And there is, um, there is a concept out there called the Eighth Fire. And uh, CBC has actually um, has a documentary and a series of, of films and, and stories um, within a, an Eighth Fire website. And that's um, accessible to anyone. So one of the ideas behind the eighth, fly, eighth fire is, is hope and, and relationship. And so I think uh, perhaps what I'm hearing um, is um, you know, a bit of the resurgence of, of the eighth fire. And uh, I'm not sure if you could elaborate on that for me, um, uh, Elder Kroshu. Um, I got to admit, I, I don't know too much about the eight five. <laughs> There's a lot of concepts. Uh, there was one concept that comes out that came out. It was a, a four directions concept with a circle and uh, and and uh, four quadrants. I know in the early seventies, there was a teacher that came out to the University of Calgary, and he took this concept from psychology. He took this psycho, psych, uh, some psychology, this concept, and it, to me, he seemed to, he met with the elders, but all he did was painted it red and put a few feathers on it and sold it back to medical services or, or Indian affairs as a First Nation concept. Yeah. And ever since that happened, it's being taught in, in, in Western uh, education. The elders that I talked to talked about, we need, when our children come back, mm -hmm. we need to deprogram de -program them from that concept and start giving concepts that are true to who we are. The con there's many different concepts. I, I was told in our culture, we have our laws mm -hmm. because we're part of the geographic territory we come from. The Crees have their laws and their language because of geographic territory they come from. And in an oral culture, we have an oral system that we navigate to give rights and privileges uh, so that we can uh, survive in each other's territory. Mm -hmm. and, w and today, we don't understand that oral system or how to navigate it, not even our young people. We can look at the Western world. We have many di different disciplines, but we have a school of management. And we know how to navigate the school of management to be able to get rights and privileges or to teach and so on. We know that in a written context, but do we ever teach our, our young people those systems in an oral culture? I equally don't know much about the eighth fire, but I kind of get it. Um, how, I, how I live it out, because um, coming from a Cree upbringing, all my life was that, but living in a very Western urban world. I always say to, um, I cannot live the way I want to live based on the construct in which Western society has put before me. I don't like the way the, our housing is. I don't like the way in which we, um, uh, we educate ourselves. I don't like the way we accredit ourselves. I don't, there's, there has to be what I call the, uh, the in-between way. There either has to be a way in which it's based on traditional ways, there has, or it has to be a way based on academics ways. But for me, there has to be this eighth fire way, where we um, 
where all the stones are brought together and we, we burn things so the purest and most truest component parts come out, right? So the, what is good, what is true, what is beautiful in both those systems make our society a better place for everybody. Whether you're um, you know, white, uh, yellow, red, or black, that whole system has to be, we have teachings in which everybody can live in a good way. And I'd also like to ask about um, the, uh, the connection between um, residential schooling and cultural genocide. And, um, and cultural genocide is defined by, by the UN. And the UN uh, recently, actually in 2007, um, declared, um, made a de declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples in, throughout the world. Um, so, do you agree with the connection of, or the idea of culture genocide as a result of residential schooling? And, you know, where's the evidence uh, that we see today? And what is the impacts of such violation on lives and communities? Um, well, it's factual, right? That's a fact that um, the, whether the Anglican Church or the Catholic Church the, the system was to, um, like, like I said about my grandfather, pull out all that was heathen, and that's the word that it is, and to, to ensure there's anything left for that that person could be capable of salvation. So there's an old adage, if you look into their mouth, can you see heaven inside of it? And there's fear that Aboriginal people, because of the drum, and because of the systems that they believed in, that these people were not capable of salvation. That's, that is the truth that they believed back then. And so if that's what cultural annihilation is about, the church, at Anglican Church, I can speak for Anglican Church, and we've apologized for that specifically, it is true. Um, what was the other questions? You had like five. <laughs> yeah. Right, and, and today I still think the church is still, I, I brought this little, this is, I, I brought, this is my, um, the way in which the clergy dress is very, very specific, thank you, is very, very specific. It's based on Roman, um, Roman um, history. And there's a little thing called an amice, which, which protects you from the, the metal part of it. And all these component parts, everything was based on a foreign land. Right. So the first thing I gave up, and it drives everybody in my church crazy, they still make fun of it, is my, this is my, I wear this on Sundays. It's the thing that the, the priests wear, the white thing which the priests wear, I changed it to this. Because I wanted to, to show that um, our culture has space within the Christian narrative. In fact, our culture may even be more in line with the Christian narrative. And stuff like this, though it, sh it shocks some of the more mature clergy, there's a group of younger clergy that are, I always say, of this land as well who want to learn about smudging, who want to learn what it means to be in this circle. And all the concepts that are coming up in Edmonton, particularly like, like permaculture and beekeeping and all these things, and, uh, and forest, um, food forests, I try to encourage those things within our, uh, within, within our clergy community and our, our churches because those are creed teachings. Right, and those are, in my mind, I always say to my, my, when you pick up, when your children were born, the creator picked up this piece of land right here, not, not some far off land like Scotland or Ireland. They didn't go back there, oh, let's sift it out. They picked up, the, you know, Miriam, who was just born recently, picked up, the creator picked up this piece of land with all my ancestry here, all the people who have died for 10,000 years, all the people who have been died, and breathe, Whew. Miriam. And now she is of this land. 
So all the teachings that are, are in the memories that are in me are now in Miriam. So she will automatically be connected to wanting to do permaculture, wanting to be beekeeping, be more in tune with the land. So I think that is the only way in which the church has to give up its, its own meta narrative of being a, of a, of a far off church. It has to be a church of this land. Yes, thank you for that. And um, I'll ask um, uh, Dr. Kroshu, how can we reconcile um, the education systems? Is it possible to do so? And how would it look? One of the concepts that uh, we're working with today with the elders is a concept that we look at when we look at Western management systems, organizations, and goals and objectives and mandates and so on, we know how to navigate it, like I was saying. But how do we, we don't want to take that Western written system and combine it with an oral system. Because once you do that, you're going to um, have cultural confusion. You need to pull them apart mm -hmm. and look at what is ethical space. If ethical space needs to be paralleled, we need to know what are the principles and practices of an oral ethical space concept, and are they parallel to Western written concepts of ethical space? And then you develop that ethical space so we can bring the two parts together to have a discussion, to hear each other. And the elders are always saying the more parallels we find, we can start finding solutions for the future. So I see that the parallels that come from those ethical spaces are so important. We need to come together. Whether whether we were the band or the shirt, mm -hmm. those are parallels, mm -hmm. but we still have our practices that talks about, mm -hmm. that, allows it, that allows us that ethical space to be able to talk about the ribbon shirt or the collar. Mm -hmm. I think that's so, those are concepts when we look at how do we de develop cultural safe spaces to be able to have that discussion. And I remember the first time I heard uh, Dr. Kroshu talk about ethical space, and it was in 2014 at an elder summit gathering. And the whole, the, the whole concept and the, the practices that are associated with ethical space, I think does have a whole lot of potential and healing power from various traumas um, that resulted from residential schools. And it is, in essence, as Dr. Kroshu had says, had, had, is saying, is that it's bringing people from different backgrounds uh, together to have sometimes difficult discussions. And, um, and hearing some of these stories, the horrific stories, that happened within residential schools, and of course that was federally mandated again, um, requires those, those culturally safe spaces. And, um, and I think that is um, another thing that I'm hearing from, from, from both uh, Dr. or Reverend Enright and Dr. Kroshu. So I'd like to open it up now for uh, questions um, from the audience. And we've got we've got one here. Hi, uh, I was just wondering how can there be proper reconciliation when uh, I don't see any evidence of you know both liberal and conservative governments really being truly sorry for what they did, right? And uh, a lot of the churches aren't aren't very sorry either, right? Maybe some are, but. I don't see much evidence from the Catholic Church or, or even our current liberal or conservative governments of actually being truly sorry. 
I mean, sorry is just not words. You have to demonstrate your sorry, right, by actually doing things. Are you sorry? Uh, well. Uh, no, I'm serious. Are you sorry? You live in this world. You live in this community. Right. You're a voting member. You're a man of faith. Um, we sometimes advocate our own apologies, our own ways of being to some political. That's what happened to in, with Indian residential schools. 15 or 20 people made policies that affected hundreds of thousands of people. The only way that we can actually start on being a road of real sorrow is having everyday Canadians take this up and be affected by the story of murdered and missing women. Have the story of having chronic foster children who are dying in care. And those, are, those stories are not happening 50, 60 years. They are happening this moment. And they continue to happen. That's right. So we as a people have to start saying no to that and yes to something else. And if that means for you voting, that's one thing. If does that mean you going off and learning safe space and ethical treatment, that is it. But it's, it's, it is as much your responsibility. I'm not trying to be mean or crude to you. It is that we sometimes make it their problem, the politicians' problems, the church's problem. The question is, are you sorrow? Well, so then, then that's, a, that's, and that's, and, and so but then you're doing that. You keep that up, right? That's, oh, that's my advice that I have. Each voice, there's many people here. If each of these people acted on their sorrow, acted on their apology, acted on their desire to be a reconciled people, the world will be different. Hi, so it seems to me that uh, it might be a good idea if we move towards reconciliation as a people that we learn about indigenous culture and I'm wondering where people who don't have that opportuni opportunity usually might be able to learn about Aboriginal culture in this area or in Alberta. Um, I know we have, um, we have a, um, a lot of centers that, that we can learn I know each of the reserves have uh, cultural centers and they offer cultural programs. But we also, uh, uh, through the centers, the cultural centers, you can um, meet the families of those communities. And the traditional thinkers or, or the families, will, we can also have discussions and learn. Within the city, I just want to say one story. In 1912, Guy Wittick went and invited all the tribes to come to the stampede. And each reserve he went to, he got kicked off because the Indian agent kicked him off and said, our Indians aren't going to the stampede. They go aren't going to regress to savages. They're going to be ranchers and farmers. So it was the Indian agent but Guy Wittig didn't stop there. He went to Ottawa and, and, and seek the uh, permission from the government, and he came back mm -hmm. with that permission that overread, overruled all the Indian agents, and he met with the First Nations, with the, the elders, and they said, your languages, we want to show your language, your culture, your way of life as a tourist venue. The elder said, you can use it as a tourist venue, but our partner in this venture is you provide us a space where we can practice and live and dance and speak. Provide that institution, we'll go and save our culture, but you uh, uh, 
uh, can go ahead and sell uh, the tourism content of it. Because on the reserve, we weren't allowed to speak our language or our ceremonies. So there was a partnership that started in 1912, and still the families that camped there are still representatives from the original families in 1912. So I see the Indian village as an institute that has information and families that you can also learn from. Thank you. Uh, can I respond as well? Um, one of the, the, the direct effects of Indian Resident School for me personally is I do not speak Cree well. My mom can gossip and she, I can get it. But I can't speak back to her in Cree, um, and that always bugs me. And they're so in Edmonton, um, the 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 one of the biggest partners that we have is the the city uh, libraries, and they're they're having elders who are willing to teach Cree for free, right? But the question is, how are you going to approach this learning, right? I think you have to approach this these learnings. Is this is the language of the land? Right? You don't learn it as a foreign thing or a cool thing. Learn it that you, so you can understand the very land in which you are walking on. If you come from that perspective, you know, learn it that this is the, your language. This is the language in which you walk on. So if you want to be able to speak to the land, if you want to be able to speak to the trees, learn the language that the, the, the land is speaking. Hi, um, so I just have a question to just play off of what uh, Dr. Reg Kroshu had said. We hear a lot of stuff about how language is culture and culture is language. And so for me, language and, and how we use language is very important. So what is your opinion on the name Indian village? When you think of the word Indian and it has all that negative connotation as opposed to even Aboriginal like there's an elder um, from Kadot, or near Kadot Lake, because I'm from Northern Alberta, late Peter O'Chis, who had said he didn't like the word Aboriginal because it indicates we are not the original people of Canada. And so since I heard that in 2002, I don't use that word. So just thinking of how language is changing, and now a lot of agencies, and even um, the youth, or like where you're representing um, Indigenous studies, Right, and a lot of people are using indigenous. And so how do we change concepts uh, if we keep some of the same language? I just kind of want your opinion on that. Um, maybe my question would be, what is your opinion on Mokin Sisitoki Go? I, in our language, our language is not written. But if that Indian was used by another culture to identify us, that's their stories, not our stories. Yeah. Our stories is elbow, mohkin, itoki, the camp. That's what the elders talk about. And we know what we're talking about. We need to start looking at how can we get to that ethical space to look at solutions for the future. Somebody's got to talk about and the other person's got to talk about Indian village at the Calgary Stampede. I think those, that discussion still needs to happen. Hello? Yeah. One of the biggest things that I've come to realize, again, as I've been sifting through story and song and drumming and ceremony, is identity. And I, I explained to her, I, I don't know if I'm an indigenous person. I know I'm not a Métis, even though I'm a half-breed, right? And then they, all, this, so all, these, all these other terms have been thrown at me until my mother says, you know, this is who you are, right? And she, usually, and she tells me in Cree what it is. And then that, that way, and he wouldn't, my mom wouldn't call him that, right? He'd call him something else, right? And, 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 and he probably wouldn't want to be called that, <laughs> right? So 
It is. There's a, a conversation, I think, within Aboriginal communities, Indigenous communities, First Nation communities, about identity and how we self-identify. Like a German would never call themselves a Frenchman, right? And a Frenchman would never call themselves necessarily European, right? And they definitely wouldn't call themselves white, right? They would call themselves the people who they are, right? So I think we have to have a larger imagination within um, the, the language, the linguistics of, of our country. And if English is not working, why not use Blackfoot or Cree as part of that um, makeup? Uh, one of the things we look at from our perspective, oral perspective, is the concept of natural laws. We believe that we're a part of the environment that we live in. We're not any better than the rocks, the buffalo, the stars, the wind. We're all equal. In our culture, we, nobody was given dominion mm -hmm. to be superior over the rest. In our culture, our belief system is we're all equal with the rock. So if I need a rock, I need permission from the rock. So we have what we call natural laws. Natural law is a blade of grass. You give it water and sun, it's going to grow. That's not natural law. In our oral culture, stories are so important. Stories define who we are. Stories talk about where we come from. Stories define the power of healing within that plant. Those stories that come from the environment that we live in, the natural law that we live in, become absolute laws. And those stories we cannot change. So today when we have challenges we need to solve, we need to go back to our language, need to go back to our stories and find those solutions on, on how we can move ahead. In, in the Western concept, I heard one of the elders talking and the elder said, well, with the white man, I know they have their holy land. And in their holy land, their leader, they weren't listening to him. So he went up into his mountains to meet his creator. And his creator gave him um, symbols on the rocks. When he brought them symbols back, he led his people. And the elder went on to say, today if I steal or kill or break anything with those laws on the rocks, those rocks are still strong. They could put me in jail. And that's what I heard him saying in our language. Of course, he was talking about Moses and the Ten Commandments. And we, we consider that as absolute law. But what if we took that story and we said, oh, it's just a legend or a fable. Let's change that story. Can you imagine what it's going to do to the Canadian judicial system if we do change that story? And that's why I say our, our absolute laws are our stories. And those stories we cannot change because those stories tie us to the land that we come from. We hear about juris, Aboriginal jurisdiction to the land that's recognized by government. What is jurisdiction? It's those stories. It's those songs. It's those ceremonies that tie us to that land. Well, I think uh, within, as was mentioned, within language, um, their language does does hold a lot of the answers. And when you start exploring um, and deconstructing words, um, you do find uh, answers to identity. And that that whole idea of all my relations, how we're connected to each other, not only humanity not only humanity, but within humanity, but humanity to, to creation and to the cosmos. Just all of those intricate and essential um, connections. And I, in terms of identity, again, um, one of the four, four uh, questions that I 
typically ask um, in my classrooms is, um, who am I? Um, where do I come from? Where am I going? What is my responsibility? And we can ask that as a Canadian society also. Who are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going? What are our responsibilities? So, you know, once we start exploring those for ourselves individually and as a collective, uh, I think it's also, you know, a movement, it could inspire a movement towards uh, um, sustainable and meaningful reconciliation. So are there any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you for for. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes. The toughest one. Thank you, thank you. That this is wonderful. I'd like to ask you a question. I don't mean to be controversial or anything like that, but because I'm a firm believer that there's always something positive, no matter how things get, how bad they get, how dark it is. As I, people know here that I am a granddaughter of a survivor of Armenian genocide, so we've been through horrific experiences as well. Was there anything beneficial from the Western civilizations that contributed to the indigenous people here? Is there anything positive that had come out of this? Okay. <laughs> I guess uh, uh, for the first thing, uh, the language I'm speaking now is something positive that came out of it because we live in the world that that English is 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 one of the main languages. I learned to read and write, and I learned to explore other cultures through their language. I learned technology that we use today. I had a chance to talk to elders and youth facilitate uh, a, a, a discussion. And, and the youth were sitting there with their computers like this. And the elders were saying, how can we talk to the youth when they don't listen to us? And the, and the youth were saying, well, the elders are always talking about old stories, so we don't understand what they're saying. So we had a part of our discussion, we talked about understanding each other. So the elders talk to the youth, how do you understand through that machine? The youth said, we have data, and then we have data with context. Mm. And data with context is information. Mm. We take that information and that knowledge, and we put it into megabytes mm. and bandwidths, which are packages. And then we put them, we buy megabytes and bandwidths through our computers so that we can understand the knowledge that we just purchased, whether it's a game or knowledge. And that's the digital world we live in. The elders had their discussion and they came back and they said, you're right. In our culture, oral culture, we have data but we also have data with context when the healers talk about that same data. Then it becomes knowledge. That knowledge is stored in packages that we also have. And those packages are called stories. And we can buy one or two stories. But we also have modern technology. Our technology is oral technology. You bring a rattle, a drum, a sweet grass to the elder, the holder of those stories, and you pay your license or your fee to them through gifts, then they'll take the drum and the smudge and they'll open up those stories and tell you the stories. So that was our oral uh, computers that they were saying. So once there was that cross validation and understanding between the youth and the elders, they were able to have discussion to look at the future. And I believe at residential school, I learned one sign. And with my grandparents and my relatives, I learned the oral sign. So between the two options, I can look at options of uh, solutions in the future.
A furnace is the only thing I can say. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, I know that Justice uh, Marie Sinclair at the closing ceremony said that reconciliation um, that is required at, because of the experiences at residential school is a collective responsibility. And um, so each one of us um, has to consider what that responsibility is and, and what our role in, um, in that process of reconciliation is. And we also have to have that dialogue, as was mentioned today, in ethical spaces, those safe cultural um, spaces to where we can have those, uh, those difficult conversations and to explore the possibilities of healing and strengthening Canada. As I mentioned, um, there were approximately 150 students that, that survived. Actually, some of them didn't survive the experience of residential school. And those were, those were children that directly went to the school. And there were many, many, many more that were indirectly affected. And we hear these stories today. Um, you know, with Reverend Enright, and he didn't attend residential school, but, but was directly affected by it. And Elder Kroshu attended residential school, and many members in my family attended residential school. My grandfather spent um, most of his uh, formative years in residential school. And as, like uh, Elder Kroshu, um, there was a group of them that traveled approximately 90 miles uh, from Gordon's residential school to our home community. And uh, as soon as they got in there, the Indian, uh, to their auntie's home actually, uh, an Indian agent was waiting for them. And so they were taken directly back, uh, back to the schools. So that is the, the pain exposed. The stories are the pain exposed. And now the healing, the healing begins, and I think it also uh, begins with relationship and having and and just being with each other in spaces like this. So I do consider this an ethical space. And the last thing um, that Justice Lurie, Marie Sinclair had said is reconciliation is about forging and maintaining respect, respectful relationships. There are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. And we, and he, he said um, at the closing ceremonies, we have described for you a mountain, and those are the 94 recommendations. We have shown you a path to the top. We call upon you to do the climbing. And that is um, beginning today. And it may not, it may take a while because the, it took a while for us to get here, seven generations, and it may take a while for us to, um, to, to reach the top of another mountain, which is reconciliation. So I'd like to thank um, Reverend Enright, Enright sorry, and, and Reg Kroshu, Dr. Reg Kroshu, for their story. Um, and for you, uh, each one of you, for attending uh, this session this afternoon. As we end today's 2015 Human Rights Forum, I hope that those who came to increase their knowledge are walking away with a better understanding that those within the Aboriginal community are leaving with lighter hearts. And I'm grateful to those who came to support our community. On behalf of the organizers and sponsors of this conference, it is indeed my pleasure to make a few closing remarks and express gratitude to all those who made this event a reality. An event becomes a success, success sorry, only if participants arrive. Thank you everyone for spending your lunch hour with us. Um, without your interest and participation, this event would not be possible. To the Calgary Public Library, thank you for continuing to show your support by providing such a wonderful venue for the Human Rights Forum. I would also like to convey my sincere thanks <clears throat> to the panelists, Reverend uh, Canon Travis Enright and Elder Dr. Reg Kroshu and moderator Dr. Jackie Ottman for joining us today and sharing your experiences with us. This past uh, year was one in which our country reflected as a whole through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Your words today have helped to set our community as well as the rest of the population along the path to healing. So thank you again for being part of this. 
On behalf of Spirit Staffing, I would like to personally thank Global Fest and its organizers who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this week a success. For the past five years, Spirit Staffing has been invited by Global Fest to sponsor the Human Rights Forum, as we are an Aboriginal woman-owned uh, staffing agency who whole, wholeheartedly uh, dedicates our service to assisting Aboriginal people advance in the workforce. In closing, I would like to give a special thanks to TD uh, Bank for sponsoring the 2015 Human Rights Forum. Your continued support makes this event a, a success.